Bill Lutz. Okay. <laughs> This is my high-tech presentation. Uh, for, for, uh, for those of you who don't know me, first of all, the advertisement. I know we're not supposed to advertise, but I'm an author. And if I don't do this, my publisher doesn't. So, you know, this is the book. I hope you buy it. Um, <laughs> it's mid-list nonfiction, an endangered species. Uh, secondly, uh, just to, for those of you who read AIGA Journal, uh, in the next issue, which Steve Heller told me the other day, he's finally getting around to putting together, I have an article on, you're going to love this title, on visual doublespeak. But it's something I've been interested in for quite a few years, and I've gathered a whole bunch of stuff, and he persuaded me to do an article and had a lot of fun, and I think it's something I'm going to be working with for a while. Also, uh, in addition to uh, being an academic, and by the way, this just feels like my class that I teach every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I also use a mic, and I have about this many students. Um, I, I've just brought to completion a two-year project with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which about a few, just a few weeks ago issued their draft regulations and the draft handbook, and the regulations will require plain language in all financial disclosure documents, including mutual fund prospectuses, MD&As, and notes to the financials in the annual report. And the two things that I was pleased that the SEC listened to me on is one, in the draft regulations and in the handbook we give you before and after examples, but most importantly in the handbook, one third of the handbook is devoted to design. And we give the advice in the handbook that if you don't have a good in-house designer, hire one. That clear communications depends upon design, not just plain language. And uh, you can get copies of that, by the way, free. Um, <laughs> Call 800-732-0330. SEC will send you this stuff. Uh, they'll be glad to do it. Okay, confession. I'm a lawyer, for those of you who noticed. I went to law school when I was uh, appointed head of the English department because I needed a hobby. And I found a loophole in Rutgers regulations that allowed me to go to law school free. They've since plugged that loophole. But I did it because I love language and law is language. And it's part of my continuing love affair with language and with the law, um, and with words, and it keeps growing. It's, a, it's kind of a passionate love affair that's gotten out of control. So if I get a little emotional, uh, please excuse me, but I feel deeply about what I talk about. And finally, uh, two of the themes that we've been talking about, Philadelphia, I moved there in 1971. Um, not a native, but I know all the good bars. Uh, two, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Please, I once wrote an article that got me into a little bit of trouble when I taught at the University of Wisconsin. It was on the etymology and the use of the word fuck. And the title of the essay was Up Against the Wall, Oedipus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for those in the know, uh, dinosaurs uh, probably do what teenagers do today. According to the San Francisco Board of Education, it's called penile insertive behavior. And, of course, the question is, what do dinosaurs and the Pentagon share in common? It's uh, pre-dawn vertical insertion, <laughs> which was the Pentagon's term for the invasion of Grenada. Uh, I like that term, by the way, because you notice you have removed the verb. Y you know, you can invade a country, but you certainly can't insert it. Um, <laughs> U.S. forces today inserted Grenada. Hmm. And, and finally, I like the term consensual marketing. I, I have three pages of notes um, from the last couple of days, and I was going to just do my talk on those notes, but I've decided not to. But uh, you'll like consensual marketing because of consensual encounter. According to the United States Supreme Court, here's what a consensual encounter involves. You are standing in front of your house having a cigarette. You're leaning against the car. A few of your buddies are coming over and you're going to go down to the pool hall and shoot some pool. Two cops come along and they roust you. Now, you have engaged in no behavior that would warrant any suspicion on their part. In fact, you say, hey, I'm waiting for the guys. We're going to go shoot some pool. They demand identification. What would you do at that point? You know, if you lived in South Philadelphia, you knew damn well what you'd do. That wall would come out real fast. Violates, of course, all the principles, but the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. This is a consensual encounter. 
whole new definition of consensual there, isn't there? I wonder if that's what we mean by consensual marketing. <laughs> and the story on Sumner Redstone that Ken Oletic told, I love that one. Perfect example of doublethink. Doublethink as defined by George Orwell was the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your mind while simultaneously believing in both of them. War is peace, you know. Um, what does Sumner Redstone say? One hand he's saying he denounces all of that, and the other hand he sits in the board meeting and takes the money. It's like my former wife, you know, who was a nurse who smoked. <laughs> Had no trouble at all justifying smoking. She said it's all DNA, you know. So the ability to hold two opposing ideas at the same time, something we always do. Uh, Henry Kissinger testifying before Congress at one point when he was Secretary of State that a continued arms buildup is absolutely essential for any hopes for meaningful arms reduction. <laughs> but what I want to talk about tonight is the power of language to shape our perceptions. The words that we choose are extremely important. And there's a whole thing that I could give you on that, but words send us down a road and keep us from going down other roads. And they do it in a way that we're not even aware of. Uh, and I'm going to focus on something very specific that's happening to us today because of this power of language and the way we use it. Let me read uh, just a brief opening. This is uh, my friend David Bradley. Uh, I don't know if you know David, his novel. Um, if you haven't read The Cheneysville Incident, you should. He won the Penn Faulkner Award for it. It's an incredibly powerful novel. But when he was, uh, David is black, by the way, he's black Philadelphian, um, he teaches at Temple. And his first novel is entitled South Street, and he wrote it when he was 23 years old. It's still a good novel, but it was a coming-of-age novel. It's been reissued. And it's the story of a young black man coming of age in the city of Philadelphia, Adlai Brown. And Adlai is sort of taken under the wing of Jake, an older black man, who's teaching this kid the ways of the world, particularly the ways of the world if you're a young black male in Philadelphia. And at one point, Adlai gets frustrated, and he lashes out at Jake, and he calls him a wino. And the old man sighs, and he looks at him, and he says... They don't call you a wino until you get old and smells bad and sleeps in alleys. If you live in a room someplace, then you're just a common drunk. And if you're young and lives in an apartment, why then, you're a heavy drinker. And if you're white, you get to be an alcoholic. And if you're white and rich and live someplace like Bryn Mawr, then you ain't an alcoholic. You're a national problem. This is what I want to talk about. In the course that I teach in a room this big, I teach, um, you know, we start with the Iliad and the Odyssey and work up to Chaucer. And I try to explain to students that in Homeric times, there was no law, written law. Uh, and the only enforcement was what the Greeks called eidos, which is shame. That if one disobeyed the commonly accepted pattern of behavior, one should feel a sense of shame. And idos was related to decay, which literally meant boundary, the boundary of your land. And one should never step over one's boundaries. One always knew one's limits. You know, remember Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, man's got to know his limits? Never thought of him as interpreting Greek ethics, did you? But idos was shame. And I look around now and I see, we don't have shame anymore. Nobody's ashamed. Just the opposite. We we do outrageous things and we're not ashamed. And I think that one of the reasons is that we have changed the words. We've invented a whole new vocabulary so that we don't have to be ashamed anymore. This is great. Let me give you just a couple examples if I can find the on switch. I hate to tell you, but I really do own three computers. But the on switch is a little easier to find. Do I have to do this on my own? In the middle? What middle? Ah. Uh, uh-uh, it's on the end. For those of you who were here last year, every good teacher begins with a review. So a very quick review. You remember Orwell did Newspeak? And remember that Newspeak was designed not to, uh, not to, designed not to extend but diminish thought? This is what language tries to do, you know, compress it, remove it away so that you don't think of certain things. 
And indeed, the purpose of Newspeak was to make all other modes of thought impossible. And this can be a function of language. Choose the right word, and you won't think about certain things. And in fact, Newspeak wants to eliminate thinking, period. In fact, it's a vast system of mental cheating. In our society, those who have the best knowledge of what is happening are also those who are farthest from seeing the world as it is. One thinks of politicians, doesn't one? And here's the key. The great enemy is insincerity. When there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, that's when we turn to what I would call doublespeak, Orwell would call newspeak. And finally, thought corrupts language. Language can corrupt thought. That's my point tonight, to watch out with what we do with words. You know, what you can do is something like this. Now, I want you to see, we'll, we'll start with some of the lesser stuff and work our way up. It's not hard to do. Um, you know, every, no, nothing's used anymore. It's owner pre-tested. Cadillac dealer nearby. My house sells uh, experienced Cadillacs. <laughs> hey, you wouldn't want one inexperienced now, would you? How much longer before he starts charging more? Um, a pre-enjoyed car. Psychologically impacted comes from the state of Connecticut. It is in state law. It was the result of a lawsuit when somebody bought a house and they claimed that it was haunted. So now you, when you list a house in Connecticut, you have to say whether it is psychologically haunted or not. <laughs> I have uh, two ghosts in my house. Uh, my house was built in 1732. It was a prison for British prisoners during the revolution. When we were remodeling, we found the curse in the house built into the wall. Uh, exceed the odor threshold. It stinks. That's what they talk about for the sewage plant. But we don't have sewage anymore. We have organic biomass or regulated organic nutrients, which, of course, are processed by the resource recovery facility. And, of course, they're not homeless. They're just non-goal-oriented members of society. The next one is the reason why you should never trust your spell checker because it let the D slip through on that. But you see, we don't kick kids out of school anymore, not in universities. We expedite progress towards alternate life pursuits. <laughs> and how many of you are familiar with customer capital cost reduction? Ah, did you catch it? That it's now officially, as of uh, January 1, outlawed by the federal government. That's when you went in to lease a car that had no down payment and they asked you for $5,000, and you said, but there's no down payment, and they said it's not, it's a customer capital cost reduction. <laughs> Thermotherapy kit, ah, that's $36 for the bag of ice that you got in the hospital. And physical examination, you all know what that is. It's the drug test. When you apply for a job, you have to undergo a physical examination. Well. Then we world, move into the world of politics. You don't have to be ashamed anymore because nobody lies. When's the last time anybody lied? Nobody lies. Hey, it's just a strategic misrepresentation, perhaps a terminological inexactitude, reality augmentation, categorical inaccuracy, counterfactual proposition, or as the British official testified at the trial when they caught him in a barefaced documented lie, he said, perhaps I was economical with the truth. <laughs> And, of course, everybody's misleading everybody else. If you do it often enough, you suffer from a fictitious disorder syndrome. This was advanced by the attorney for the client who had failed to file income tax returns for 15 years. And then we have, you may remember, inaccurate, incomplete, and unreliable statements. That was Newt Gingrich. He didn't lie, though. Uh, and then, of course, get caught and you suffer a political credibility problem. You're a liar. Now, do we have bribes? Do we have kick kickbacks? Au contraire, not anymore. We have incentive payments. 
A bribe? No, it's just normal gratitude. <laughs> How about sales credits? You like after-sales uh, services? You know where that one comes from? A Federal Trade Commission investigation into faulty uh, pacemakers that were implanted in patients, and they couldn't figure out why so many of these were implanted, and they found out that the physicians were getting things like trips to the Caribbean if they used these pacemakers. They were not called bribes or kickbacks. They were called after-sales services. And, of course, there's always the favorite rebates, which was used in a trial of mafia, excuse me, members of a career offender cartel. <laughs> That's the official term by the Straight Time Control Commission in the state of New Jersey. There are no mafia in Atlantic City. Um, and then, of course, if you remember uh, Mr. Milken, during his trial, the federal government charged him with aiding and abetting uh, his clients in tax evasion. His attorney said, no, it was account accommodation. Are you, are you an alcoholic? Are you addicted to drugs? No, you're not. You're a victim of a habitually detrimental lifestyle. <laughs> Notice that. I love that one. You're a victim. You don't do this willingly. I mean, they tie you down. They pour it down your mouth. I mean, people are jumping up and down, shooting things into your veins. You don't have anything to do with it. You're a victim. Of course, if you are a drug addict, you have a pharmaceutical preference. <laughs> Dysfunctional behavior, that was the defense advanced in a trial of a mugger. Knocked off about 18 people. His attorney said, huh, see, you know, he suffers from dysfunctional behavior syndrome. You like the quote? Advanced by a politician, a member of the United States Congress. I haven't committed a crime. What I did was fail to comply with the law. Wait a minute. Did I miss something here? Uh, unauthorized withdrawal? That's what happened in the bank when the guy came in with a gun and got the money. The bank said it wasn't a robbery, it was an unauthorized withdrawal. We have a whole new category of crime here. You know, armed unauthorized withdrawal. And then you can say, let's go down and withdraw the bank. Um, it, would it should certainly change the dialogue in, in criminal movies entirely. Um, temporarily displaced inventory is the term for shoplifting. <laughs> Payment for services rendered, well, that's another bribe, kickback, or whatever you want. Um, you know, one of the things that we do do with this language is we use it to insulate ourselves from things that are very unpleasant, and that, th there's nothing wrong with that. In the medical profession, since they deal with death, they, they do build a vocabulary to distance themselves. So, there's terminal living, there's a terminal episode, systems failure comes out of the emergency room, um, negative patient care outcome is when the patient dies on the floor, CTB is cease to breathe. <laughs> Wait, there's a better one coming. Uh, Now, I, I, I like therapeutic misadventure. <laughs> therapeutic misadventure has a legitimate definition in, in, in medicine. Uh, I had a personal example. M when my mother uh, uh, was suddenly hit with pneumonia in the middle of the night, rushed to the hospital, and of course the standard procedure is hit her with a lot of penicillin, which they did. And for that reason, I mean, she'd had penicillin all her life. She went into anaphylactic shock, almost died. Therapeutic misadventure is when the normally prescribed procedures, when applied, result in an unexpected and unforeseen outcome. Perfectly legitimate term. Shift the scene now to a hospital in Minnesota where the anesthesiologist turns the wrong knob during the cesarean delivery, kills mother and child, hospital writes it off as therapeutic misadventure, family doesn't know what's happened, doesn't know that they have a lawsuit. It has now become the term of choice for medical malpractice best example of therapeutic misadventure I heard from my neighbor, the medical malpractice lawyer, when they attached the wrong hose to the patient's chest after uh, some lung surgery and instead of the drainage tube put on the vacuum tube and sucked his heart out. Um, yeah, that's really wearing your heart on your sleeve. But, oh, he lived. He lived. Um, diagnostic misadventure of a high magnitude during a routine colon examination, Dr. Pierce, the uh, 
the uh, intestines, peritonitis, patient died, recorded in the medical records this way. Discovered by federal investigators, who ultimately, by the way, closed the hospital down, they called it a death factory. It was in Philadelphia. Patient dies, substantive negative outcome. <laughs> However, <laughs> you're way ahead of me. It's at this point I have to tell you, I make none of this up. I have a couple rules. One, the examples must be real. And two, I have to document them in the context in which they occurred so that I know for sure that they're not humorous but are real examples that were really made up. This one was given to me by a physician in the uh, uh, emergency room at about 2.30 in the morning when I, when I was there with uh, uh, taking uh, a friend in uh, who had cut his hand and chatting with, the, uh, with one of the surgeons and we were going through the terms and he gave me this one and I said, you're putting me on. And he said, no, he said, actually, he said, we always come up with new ones. Um, <laughs> now, the next one, surgical isolation of the head. I threw that one in because it's, it, it's not really medical. It comes out of Los Angeles where the cry one of the cryogenics places, you know, got a terminal disease, we freeze you and then we'll wake you up later when we get a cure. And a guy went in and he couldn't afford the $30,000 to get frozen and he had a brain tumor. So they suggested that they have surgical isolation of the head. <laughs> They're going to cut his head off. Nobody explained what was going to happen later if they thawed him out, but, you know. Uh, I thought it was such a nice way of putting it. The next three terms are all official government terms for a plane crash. Planes never crash. They have uncontrolled contact with the ground. <laughs> there is controlled flight into misspelled terrain. And there is failure to maintain clearance from the ground. <laughs> but we'll never say crash. And the final ones come from the uh, U.S. military. You all know serve as the target. Kill the enemy. That's killing. Let me give you a little story, the little context behind this one, because it's important and it illustrates how, how these terms really work. There is a novelist who is uh, a graduate of West Point, um, Vietnam veteran, lost his arm, and uh, has, has since had a career as a successful writer. He is asked to come back to the point each year to lecture the class, the senior class. And he says that he always tries to give them a really hard lecture because he said the toughest job in the world is uh, a second lieutenant in the infantry. You are, first of all, leading men into battle, which means you're leading men in to kill and be killed. So he gives this lecture about, uh, you know, you're going to have to go in and you're going to have to get men to, to, to kill. They, they've been, their whole lives have been told killing is bad. Now they have to kill. And he said, after they kill, they're going to turn to you and look for approval. Anyway, he said he gives a standard lecture. Afterwards, the colonel takes him aside and says, great lecture, but just one correction. We don't call it killing anymore. We call it servicing the target. Later, during Desert Storm, I documented a quote from a U.S. Army artillery officer who said, I don't like to think of it as killing the enemy. I prefer to think of it as servicing the target. Now, as the novelist uh, veteran said, this is the kind of stuff that gets you killed if you think you're going out there to service a target. You're going out there to kill or be killed, and this is going to get people killed. This kind of language is nonsense and does not serve these people well. There is no way to avoid the fact that the job of a soldier is to kill, and to kill efficiently, effectively, and first before you get killed, if you remember that famous scene from uh, Patton with George C. Scott. So, this is how the language can affect us. It can change the way we look at things. Is it simply collateral damage? Collateral damage is, uh, became popular during Desert Storm. Basically, it means um, we blew up some you know, schools or hospitals or civilian targets. Actually, the term comes all the way back to the early 1950s, and you can get it in the official U.S. Army or Department of Defense Dictionary of Military and Associated Terms. Collateral damage officially refers to the anticipated civilian casualties during a nuclear exchange. Not a nuclear war, a nuclear exchange like Christmas time. <laughs> Neutralize the threat. 
That's what the British did when they gunned down three IRA suspected gunmen. Um, they neutralized the threat. It has now become a term of choice uh, in uh, police departments around the world. Oh, by the way, the uh, sixth leading cause of death among males in America in 1996 was legal intervention. Capital punishment and shot by the cops. Um, and then, of course, pre-dawn vertical insertion, interrogation in depth. <laughs> well, we tortured the guy until he died. Sorry about that. Ethnic cleansing, purification, Saddam Hussein and his treatment of the Kurds. Philosophically disillusioned, you're not a coward. Coercive diplomacy, we blew up cities. That's a State Department term. And finally, unlawful or arbitrary deprivation of life. That's a State Department term for governments that kill people. And then, of course, we have traumatic amputation, blowing off arms and legs, eroding the will of the population, bombing civilian targets, effective delivery of ordinance. We hit them. We nailed those bastards. One final note. I, I, should, I, I know, you know we're not supposed to read, we're supposed to talk, but uh, I talked to Lee Lu and I told him I wanted to do this. This is on Tiananmen Square. It's a, it's a, a piece. I taught in China. When China first opened up, I was invited and I taught, and I made a lot of friends, uh, uh, graduate students and faculty and, and, and that. And uh, after Tiananmen Square, my, my letters have never been answered. I've never heard a word since then. I don't know. They were pretty politically savvy. I don't know if they're lying low. I don't know if they're dead. Um, but I wrote this piece in a moment of, of passion, um, of thinking about Ding Ying and, and, and the wonderful, wonderful people that I knew who had been my students and my friends. And it relates directly to what George Orwell wrote. If you remember in 1984, he said, reality is not external. Reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else. Not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes and in any case soon perishes. Only in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be truth is truth. It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party. And there was a time when we thought he was crazy. Consider this. Thousands of troops did not attack the students in Tiananmen Square on June 4th. No students were shot, bayoneted, or crushed by tank. No one died in Tiananmen Square. No one died in Tiananmen Square. What really happened was a triumph of restraint and sacrifice by the brave troops who, as they approached the square, were viciously attacked by savage gangs of counter-revolutionary rioters, armed, financed, and directed by overseas reactionary political forces. Despite all their attempts to subdue the rioters, the troops were forced to open fire. For as General Li Zhiyun said, the fact is the army was forced to use violence to enter the city. But even then, it never happened that soldiers fired directly at the people. Indeed, as the general pointed out, there was no such thing as bloodshed on Tiananmen Square. It is not from any instance from the soldiers directing their guns at the people. This incident never happened. Yes, it is true. The general also said if we didn't use military force, we couldn't have cleared the square, but then it never happened. The testimony of your own eyes cannot and should not be believed. The extensive videotaped scenes of the violence and death in Tiananmen Square simply misled you from the truth. After all, as Yuan Mu, the spokesperson for the government, made so clear, the development of modern technology can allow people to turn out even a longer film to distort the truth of the matter. Nor can you believe rumor-mongering eyewitnesses such as Zhao Bin, who claimed tanks and armored personnel carriers rolled over students, squashing them into jam, and the soldiers shot at them and hit them with clubs. When students fainted, the troops killed them. After they died, the troops fired one more bullet into, into them. They also used bayonets. But those who know better reported this spreader of lies. After the police had talked with Zhao Bin, he confessed his lies on television. I never saw anything. I apologize for bringing great harm to the party and the country. He also admitted he was a counter-revolutionary. So, so too did Comrade Cho admit his error. The blood in his shirt was not that of people killed during the army's attack on the square. I was wrong, Cho said. The party and the government have said nobody was killed, and I made a mistake. I was influenced by bad elements and counter-revolutionaries. The blood on my shirt was surely that of a martyred soldier. Better to believe the four young men who testified, we were at the northeast corner of the Great Hall of the People on the fourth floor. We had a clear view of the square and saw what happened. The army did not kill anyone or hurt anyone. It is not true that any students or common people were killed in Tiananmen Square. 
to guide you in correct thinking and to ensure you that you truly understand what really happened, the party provides the necessary guidance. Without the Communist Party, there would be no new China. Love the party. Love the socialist motherland. As the loyal party member said, what they really want is for you to say, we love Deng, we love the party, we love socialism. And we all say it, of course. Almost unconsciously, Winston traced with his finger in the dust on the table 2 plus 2 equals 5. It was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. And no one died in Tiananmen Square. The picture of the young man standing in front of the line of the tanks is today a government propaganda poster in China distributed widely throughout the country to prove that no one was hurt because as the government points out on the poster, all those tanks stopped lest they harm one student. Which, according to reports in Time magazine, the student was later arrested and shot. Thank you.